Very well, let us uh, resume our discussion here on the coordinate systems and we now know what a vector is and how to describe it in a Cartesian coordinate system, how its components will transform when you rotate a coordinate system as well. And now we will think about what is the most appropriate coordinate system to describe a vector, because depending on the symmetry in which objects are laid out around us, we might want to choose a different coordinate system. And before we do that, uh, let me show you a movie uh, called Motorcycle Mania and this is uh, something like what you might have seen, you, if you have seen the movie, uh, the movie lovers amongst you would have seen Doom, have you? Is there anybody here who has seen Doom? Doom 1, Doom 2 and now you are going to see Doom 3 and this is uh, by Taurus Brothers. Uh, this is available on the internet, you first have uh, 5 motorcyclists, they are all from this family the Taurus family and uh, this is an unbelievable movie. So, I think before we get into hardcore mathematics, uh, let us have a little bit of fun and this uh, you can see on the internet of course, this is the web link for it and you do not have to write down the internet link, if you just google motorcycle mania with Taurus brothers, you will get the link anyway. Google knows just about everything, so, so you can get, but you can see it here. And uh, this Motorcycle is the one. Cycle Mania, the Torres Brothers. One, two, three, four. Five. So there are five of them inside inside the steel uh, globe, okay. there are five of them inside the steel globe, and, uh, look at their adventure. If you think this was it, uh, you are mistaken, there is more. <laughs> you come out, is that right Jennifer? Yes. Alright, and then now what happens? And now they are getting rearranged to put in two more motorcycles. Right, and, and a two more and a squirrel. What we saw in this movie was fun, but the important point is that if you have motion on the surface of a globe, then it is always equidistant from the center of the globe. And if you wanted to keep track of any object which is in motion on the surface of the globe, in the Cartesian coordinate system, you would need to keep track of three parameters x, y and z. But 
the square root of x square plus y square plus z square or r square is always constant. So, there is one constraint and you really do not need to keep track of all the three parameters. So, can we choose a coordinate system in which only two parameters are sufficient and the third is held constant. So, instead of a Cartesian coordinate system, a spherical polar coordinate system will be much more compact and adequate to describe motion in this. So, depending on the symmetry in which objects are laid out around us, you choose a different coordinate system. And again in the spirit of the flat land uh, that we talked about earlier, we begin our discussion first in a flat world in which there are two degrees of freedom and you look at the position of an object, this is it is this red dot on the screen and you can describe the position of this red dot in terms of two parameters, its x coordinate which is this projection of this vector along the x axis and the y coordinate which is a corresponding projection on the y axis. So, x and y give you complete information about where this object is located. But you can also choose two other parameters, which is the distance from the origin labeled by low, rho and the angle of this line with the x axis. So, you need a reference direction, which is the direction of the x axis. So, that you have a reference direction with reference to which the angles are measured and the angular departure from the x axis, which is called as the azimuthal angle. This is the phi angle that you see in this picture and these two parameters rho and phi also describe the exact location of this object and you can do it either way either by specifying x and y or rho and phi. So, when you make use of rho and phi, you use coordinate system which is called as the plane polar coordinate system. Plane polar because you are dealing with a plane with a flat land and phi is a, uh, is a is an angular parameter. It measures the departure uh, of this line uh, from the x axis which is the azimuthal angle. And now, let us look at it in another coordinate system because we have agreed that any coordinate system in which you have got a set of base vectors or a basis which is linearly independent will work. So, instead of choosing E x and V E y as my base vectors, which are the base vectors respectively along the x axis and the y axis of the Cartesian coordinate system, I can choose any other pair of linearly independent vectors. Okay. So, instead of choosing this, I can choose this, right? it does not matter and I can choose these this red vector as one base vector and this one which is linearly independent and orthogonal to it as another base vector and I can describe the location of any object in terms of this pair of vectors which is linearly independent and it also is orthogonal. So, it is a very convenient basis set and my basis can be this vector and this vector instead of the Cartesian unit vectors E x and E y. Now, how have I selected these red vectors? The first vector this is a direct a vector of unit magnitude. So, it is a unit vector which will belong to my basis set this is along the direction of the position vector of this red object from the origin. So, from the origin I construct a position vector and in the same direction I have a unit vector which is E rho and then I take the other vector which is orthogonal to it. So, it is at 90 degrees, but it could be 90 degrees pointing this way or pointing in the opposite way. right? So, there are two directions that I can think of which are orthogonal to the this first red vector and I choose the direction in which the azimuthal angle phi would increase. So, azimuthal phi will obviously increase in this direction rather than in this direction. right? So, I choose the other vector, so that there is no ambiguity in how I choose these two unit vectors. So, this first vector is called as E rho, 
because it is along the radial radius vector or the position vector and the other one in which the azimuthal angle phi is increasing. So, this is called as the unit vector E phi and I have again these two vectors are mutually orthogonal, they are of unit magnitude. So, they constitute an orthogonal pair of unit vectors and I can use that as a basis set. The interesting thing is that if I were to have this red spot, this object over here, but instead of this position if I were to have it over here somewhere here under the cursor. Then the direction of E rho will obviously not be this, it will be along a position vector from here to here and then extended further here, right. And then the direction of E phi will be from this point in the direction in which phi is increasing, so it will be in this direction, right. So, E rho and E phi are not constant vectors, they will change from point to point. Whereas, E x and E y are constant vectors, they are always along the Cartesian x and y axis respectively. So, E phi always points to the direction in which the azimuthal angle increases from wherever that point is. And these are the transformations between the Cartesian coordinates x and y and the polar coordinates which are called as a plane polar coordinates. So, these are the equations of coordinate transformation. This is the range of the corresponding parameters x and y both go from minus infinity to plus infinity, but rho and phi rho which is root of x square plus y square and phi is of course, tan inverse of y over x as you can see easily from this geometry. And rho of course, can change from 0 to infinity rho equal to 0 will give you the point of origin itself and notice that the range of phi is from 0 to 2 pi, but the equality phi equal to 0 is included, the equality phi equal to 2 pi is excluded because phi equal to 2 pi would give you the same point. So, so you have to you know uh, avoid duplication of the uh, of the points. So, you can write the transformations between E x and E y because E rho now you can think of some vector and you can always write it as a linear superposition of the base vectors. So, you write E rho as a superposition of E x and E y and these will come from the corresponding cosines right and do the same with E phi and these are the equations of transformation between E x and E, e y from these you can construct E rho and E phi and you can carry out the inverse transformations and from E rho and E phi you can get E x and E y. So, you can carry out these transformations very easily and what you have is known as the plane polar coordinate system with the base vectors and the transformation relations written exactly. In this the position vector of course, is rho times E rho, okay. rho is the distance and you have both the magnitude as well as direction. Remember however, that E rho and E phi are not constant vectors, they will change from point to point and you therefore, want to know what is the law which governs this change. How do you determine these the, the changes in these quantities, changes with respect to what? change is always with respect to something. Okay, change is either with respect to time or with respect to an angle or with respect to a distance. So, there is some independent parameter and with respect to these independent parameters you look for a change. In Cartesian coordinate system no matter which point in space you are talking about the unit vectors E x and E y do not change. In other words, the derivative of E x with respect to x is always 0, because E x the unit vector E x is a constant with respect to x, it is also a constant with respect to y, right. What about the derivative of E rho and E phi? Do they change with rho and phi? Will E rho change with rho? E rho will not change with rho, because all along that line the direction is always away from the center along the radial line right and of unit magnitude. So, you know that E rho does not change with rho and you can say that del E rho by del rho which is the derivative of E rho with respect to rho would vanish. Now, I am using partial derivatives 
because there are two parameters to talk about rho and phi right. So, whenever we deal with these quantities you have to keep track of how they vary with position and time and in the, the it is the time derivative of the position vector which will give you the velocity, it is the time derivative of the velocity which will give you the acceleration and it is these quantities that you have to work with when you set up an equation of motion right. So, you have to take the time derivative of the position vector to get the velocity and when you take the time derivative of the position vector, but the position vector is now expressed in terms of the polar coordinate system rather than the Cartesian coordinate system. In which case you must take treat this as a product of two functions, rho is a scalar, e rho is a vector and you must ask does this change with time and you should also ask if this changes with time and in principle if the object is moving right, if it moves only along the radial line if this is the origin and it moves only along the radial line in one direction right, then e rho is not going to change, but if it is having some half a z motion right, then e rho will change from time to time and you must take the time derivative of e rho with respect to time. In other words you will have to take the differential of e rho with respect to time. So, you have to keep track of these things to get acceleration you have to do this process twice because it is a second time derivative. So, e rho we know will not change with rho e phi which is always orthogonal to it in the direction in which the azimuthal angle is increasing will also not change with rho ok. So, you can write two arguments for the sake of completeness but actually neither e rho nor e phi change with rho, but both change with respect to phi. So, you construct what is called as a unit circle, you have the azimuthal angle and you have a point and let us say this is at position 1 and at this position the unit vector e rho is this. So, I subscript it with 1 corresponding to this point 1 and the corresponding azimuthal unit vector is e phi with a subscript 1. Now, this is the relation that we have learnt earlier and in general these unit vectors will change from point to point and each point must have these two parameters, but the dependence on rho of these unit vectors actually disappears. They do however, change with the azimuthal angle. So, let us ask in what way they will change with, with the azimuthal angle. So, we, we, we need to find how e rho will change with phi. So, you have to take the derivative with respect to phi. This is the rate at which the unit vector e rho changes with phi. So, you take the derivative of the right hand side with respect to phi and the derivative of cosine phi will give you minus sin phi, the derivative of sin phi will give you cos phi, so far so good, but this is some kind of a hybrid relation, because some of its quantities are polar like sin phi, cos phi, e rho, e phi, uh, e rho phi, del e rho by del phi, all of these are polar parameters. The reason this equation is a hybrid equation is because this is described in terms of the unit vectors which are the Cartesian unit vectors rather than the polar unit vectors. So, you must transform this completely to the polar system. So, you can write E x and E y in terms of E rho and E phi, we have already done that through the inverse relations and then substitute for E x and by these quantities on the right hand side and this is completely polar now right the right hand side of these equations are completely polar and then the result will be expressed completely in polar parameters. So, now you have del e rho by del phi which is this del e rho by del phi which is this minus sin phi which comes over here times e x and e x written in polar coordinate system is given by the right hand side of this first equation over here which comes over here and now this has got terms in e rho and e phi over here and also terms in e rho and e phi over here. So, if you combine all of them you find that this minus sin phi cos phi e rho cancels the plus sin phi cos phi e rho 
and the remaining components which is minus sin phi into minus sin phi which is sin square phi and the product of these two cosines give you cos square phi and then the sin square phi and cos square phi gives you unity when added up. So, this result is that the rate at which the unit vector e rho changes with phi is equal to the unit vector e phi itself. It is a very simple derivation. Okay. Notice that the derivative of the unit vector with respect to phi is a vector, it is a direction in space. The derivative of e rho with respect to phi is along e phi, because the derivative measures a change. A change is always orthogonal, it is always perpendicular to the quantity in which you are seeking the change, otherwise it would not be a change at all. right? So, any change is always orthogonal to the quantity in which you are seeking this change. So, del e rho by del phi is equal to e phi, it is orthogonal to e rho and you can also get a geometrical determination rather than taking the derivatives of the sin and cosine functions and this is also a good exercise to do, which is by looking at this by studying the geometry. So, you see that you have got a point 1 and you construct the corresponding unit polar vectors e rho 1 and e phi 1 and move this point to a adjacent point on the unit circle. What is the change? The change is because of the change in phi. So, that is the principal cause that is the independent degree of freedom with respect to which you are seeking a change. So, now at the point 2 you construct the polar unit vectors. So, this is e rho 2, e phi 2 will be orthogonal to e rho 2 and in the direction in which phi is increasing, but e rho 1 is this vector and what I have done is to subtract from e rho 2 the vector e rho 1. So, this is e rho 1, this is minus e rho 1, right? it is parallel to it and directed oppositely. So, this difference gives me the change in the unit vector at these two adjacent points. right? And whenever you take the derivative, what you do is look at the difference in the value of the function divided by the difference in the independent parameter and take the limit that the denominator goes to 0. It is d y by d x, which is delta y by delta x in the limit delta x going to 0. So, that is how you define, define a derivative. right? So, you have this difference in the two unit vectors, which is from this geometry you can immediately see that this when you subtract from this vector, this vector you will get a vector which is in this direction, it will be in the direction of e phi and of magnitude delta phi, because you are constructing this on a unit circle. right? So, this difference is equal to delta phi e phi. Now, if you divide this quantity by delta phi, and take the limit delta phi going to 0, you get the corresponding derivative, which is a partial derivative of e rho with respect to phi and this derivative is equal to e phi as we have already seen in the previous slide. right? So, you get exactly the same result as you certainly should and then uh, you can do this for the other vectors for the difference in e phi at position 2, subtract from it e phi at position 1. Okay. Let us look at it again. First, you construct e phi at position 2, subtract from it the e phi at position 1 and if you see this difference vector in the limit the delta phi goes to 0, you can already see that it will be directed toward the origin of the coordinate system. So, it will be along minus e rho. Right? And as you would expect, a change in e phi will be along e rho. The change in the unit vector will always be orthogonal to the corresponding unit vector, okay? but it will be directed toward the center rather than away as you can see from this geometry and indeed you get that result that the change in this e phi divided by delta phi in the limit delta phi going to 0 is equal to minus e rho. So, you can get these derivatives of unit vectors and one must get used to this idea, because very often we do algebra 
uh, we make use of the Cartesian coordinate system in which the unit vectors are always held constant. And it is important to keep track of the fact that we use coordinate systems very often depending on the symmetry in which uh, objects are laid out around us. And if we were to use the polar coordinate system, then the unit vectors will change from one point to another. And if they are going to change, they will do so at a certain rate. And that rate is given by the derivative of that unit vector with respect to the independent degrees of freedom. These independent degrees of freedom are rho and phi. And we now have this, we can consolidate these results that the derivative of the unit vectors e rho and e phi with respect to rho are both 0, but I am using partial derivatives because we do so while holding the azimuthal angle as a constant. And the partial derivatives with respect to the azimuthal angle however, do change and del e rho by del phi is equal to e phi and del e phi by del phi is equal to minus e rho. So, these, the, these are our consolidated results. Now, we often have to make use of what is called as a chain rule and you would have used this in elementary calculus that if you have a function xi of u in which u itself is a function of x, then the change in xi with respect to x is because of change in xi with respect to u influenced by the change in u with respect to x. So, this is the chain rule that the rate at which xi changes with respect to x is given by the product of the rate at which xi changes with respect to u with the change with the rate at which u changes with respect to x. Now, you may have a more complex dependence on x because xi may depend on u as well as on another parameter v and both u and v may change with respect to x. If that were to happen, then the rate of change of xi with respect to x will come from both the contributions. Why xi changes with respect to u and at what rate does it do so? So, that rate will be given by the partial derivative of xi with respect to u. Now, you must use a partial derivative because there is a dependence that xi have on another parameter namely v. Okay? So, this is the partial derivative of xi with respect to u multiplied by the derivative of u with respect to x and then there may be a derivative of xi with respect to v multiplied by the rate at which v itself changes with x. So, this is a little more complex than the previous case, but then who stops you from increasing the complexity. So, you can have a dependence of xi on x, not because of its dependence on u as we had in the previous case. Yes, you may have that. In addition to that, you may have a dependence of xi on x through its dependence on v, but in addition to that, you may have a direct dependence on x. Why not? If that is to happen, then the rate at which xi will change with respect to x will be determined by these three terms which must be summed up. You must take the product of how xi changes with respect to u influenced by the rate at which u changes with x, how xi changes with respect to v influenced by how v changes with respect to x. So, that is the derivative of v with respect to x and then the derivative of xi with respect to x because of its direct dependence this is sometimes called as the explicit dependence of xi on x. Whereas, over here the dependence of xi on x is called as the implicit dependence on x. Okay? So, this is the difference between an explicit dependence and an implicit dependence. So, when, it, when a function depends on a parameter directly, it is an explicit dependence. When it depends on some other quantity, which in turn depends on another independent parameter, then it is called as an implicit dependence. So, so you have to worry about some of these things and you can now do all kinds of you know geometrical, you can construct geometrical objects like area and here if you are to represent an area in the Cartesian coordinate system 
the thing to do would be to construct elemental areas and these will be like rectangles in the flat space right and then you can add up these rectangles to get the net area integrate this now similarly you can construct these elemental areas in the polar coordinate systems and these will not be rectangles but these will be made up of a region of this flat land which is sandwiched between an increment in the polar distance rho. So, rho changes from rho to rho plus d rho through this little segment and the angle changes through phi and this arc will have a length of rho d phi. So, this elemental area will be rho d rho d phi in the limit that both the increments in rho and the increments in the azimuthal angle shrink to 0. So, in that limit you will get the elemental area and you can always integrate over rho and d phi depending on what kind of an object you are dealing with. So, if you were to do it for a circle you integrate this elemental area with rho going from 0 to the radius of the circle azimuthal angle phi going from 0 to 2 pi and you get the area of the circle. Okay? So, you can do this algebra in any coordinate system you can do it in Cartesian coordinate system or polar coordinate system you will need to learn to describe the position vectors the velocity and accelerations in plane polar co coordinate system. So, if you were to do it for the uh, if you want to determine the velocity then the velocity is dr by dt right. So, it is a rate of change of the position vector with respect to time and the position vector itself is this vector rho. So, you need to construct this d rho and divide it by d t rather you want to take delta rho by delta t in the limit delta t going to 0. So, the differential increment in rho will come because of increment in rho which is d rho times e rho plus rho times a change in e rho because the increment it, it, it need not be mean the, the, the object need not be always going along this line if it were to go along some other line then the corresponding azimuthal angle will be changing and the e rho unit vector of course, will change from one point to another if the azimuthal angle were to change. So, d rho will be equal to the sum of these two terms one of which is coming from the differential change in the magnitude of this and the other from its direction because e rho itself may change. And this we know how to determine because we know the rate at which these unit vectors change. This is the differential increment in this unit vector that we are interested in finding and this is no problem because we already know the rate at which this unit vector changes with rho and phi. With rho it does not change, but with respect to phi it does. Okay? So, you plug it in and then you can get the expression for the velocity which is delta rho by delta t in the limit delta t going to 0 and you get it by taking the derivative of this rho times e rho from these two terms and from the first term you get d rho by d t times e rho and from the second term you get the rate at which this unit vector changes with time. So, how do you get the rate at which this unit vector changes with time? we have found how it changes with respect to phi and this multiplied by the rate at which the angle phi itself changes with time d phi by d t and that is what I denote by a dot. When I put a dot on the variable I am referring to a time derivative. Okay? So, phi dot is d phi by d t and the rate at which this unit vector e rho changes with time is del e rho the rate at which it changes with phi because it is not going to change with rho otherwise even that would have contributed but that derivative is 0 times the rate at which the azimuthal angle changes with time. So, e phi times and this derivative we know del e rho by del phi we have already found out that this del e rho by del phi is equal to e phi. So, you have got e phi times phi dot which is d phi by d t. Okay? Likewise, you need to get the change in the derivative you, you need to look at the time derivative of the unit vector e phi and this will be the rate at which e phi changes with phi it is not going to change with respect to rho, but with respect to phi yes. So, you take the derivative of e phi with respect to phi 
scale it by the rate at which the isobethyl angle itself changes with respect to time, which is d phi by d t, which I write as phi dot and this rate is equal to minus e rho as we have determined earlier del e phi by del phi is minus e rho and phi dot is over here. So, these are the corresponding rates and with this you can now write the velocity completely in polar coordinates, because you have got everything that you need. So, velocity is given by this expression as we found from the previous screen and this d e rho by d t is e phi times phi dot. So, we have to substitute this term over here and this is you can see that you have got a component along e rho and another component along e phi. So, this is called as the radial component and this is called as the azimuthal component. So, the velocity in polar coordinates will have two components the radial component as well as the azimuthal component and you continue to express it as a linear superposition of two base vectors which give you the linearly independent base vectors. And these happen not to be constants for all points of the space nor at all times, but so what they are linearly independent and therefore, they give you a complete pair of bases. So, this is the instantaneous velocity and you can get acceleration by taking the second derivative. So, when you take the derivative of the velocity you have to take the derivative of each of these terms. You have to look at this as the product of two functions rho dot and e rho, e rho. Here this is the product of three functions rho, phi dot and e phi, because e phi is not a constant. right? So, you must take the product, use the product rule while taking the differential and if you put all the terms together, combine the terms in e rho and e phi and stack them together you can do this algebra yourself. So, you do not have to write this down, but do you do have to work it out, so that you develop confidence and comfort in using this. So, you can see that the acceleration will also have a radial component as well as an azimuthal component and these components, what will contribute to these components are the changes in rho as well as changes in phi. And because you are looking at the second derivative, the second derivative will come from this term, but also from the first derivative of phi. Mind you, the ultimate dimensions of each of these term must be the same. So, this is one thing that you should always do to ensure that you have done it right, which is to check the dimensions of the physical quantity. Because if you make some silly mistake, which all of us are very capable of. You might write just rho, 2 rho phi dot over here and forget about rho dot. And if you did that as a careless mistake, you should immediately be able to spot it yourself before you take any step further, because the dimension of rho dot phi dot will not be the same as the dimensions of rho phi dot right. Rho dot will have a dimension t inverse, which is different from that of rho itself. The dimension of every term will be l t to the minus uh, 2, right. This is the acceleration. So, for velocity it is l t to the minus 1, for acceleration it will be l 2 to the minus 2. So, always uh, develop a habit that the moment you look at a term, uh, you pick up its dimensions in your mind and make sure that you have not made any careless mistake. So, now we will go from the flat land to the three dimensional world. So, we had the e rho and the e phi in the flat world and now you add the third axis which is perpendicular to these two and that is the e z and that is what generates the so called cylindrical polar coordinate system. So, in the cylindrical polar coordinate system the base vectors are e rho, e phi and e z and this forms a right handed triad. right? So, just like e x cross e y gives you e z, you have e rho cross e phi which gives you e z always and then you have a corresponding you know if you change these in succession, you will get other two cross products giving you the other two base 
unit vectors for that coordinate system. So, this is the cylindrical polar coordinate system, which you can develop very easily by simply adding a third direction. And in this third direction, the unit vector along the z axis is a constant vector. So, not every unit vector must change from point to point. In the cylindrical polar coordinates, e rho and e phi change from point to point, but even e rho does not change if you go just along the radial line. Okay. So, you can also have a spherical polar coordinate system, because obviously, the symmetry of a cylinder and a symmetry of a sphere is different. So, depending on what kind of symmetry you are looking at, depending on how objects are laid out around you as I keep saying, okay. depending on the symmetry that is involved in the motion that you are observing or that you are analyzing. You can always choose an appropriate coordinate system, so that you can minimize the degrees of freedom that you want to keep explicit track of, because one or the other like you saw in Dhoom 3, right? the distance from the origin of a point on the globe is always held constant. So, you do not have to worry about it all the time, it is there not that it is not there, but you do not have to worry about it. So, this is the spherical polar coordinate system, in which of course, it is defined with respect to the Cartesian coordinate system, just as we did the cylindrical polar or the plane polar coordinate system. And here, each point is described by three independent degrees of freedom, and instead of x, y, z, these are r, theta and phi. r is the distance from the origin, theta is the polar angle, which is the orientation of this point with respect to the z axis. So, this is called as a polar axis. Okay. So, with respect to the polar axis, what is the orientation of this point and this is measured by theta and theta obviously, will go from 0 to pi, because it can be either oriented along the z axis or other points in space will be oriented opposite to that. So, theta will change from 0 to pi and phi is the same as the azimuthal angle of the cylindrical polar coordinate system, but instead of measuring it with respect to the x axis alone, you measure it with respect to the z x plane, because this is the three dimensional world that we are now working with. So, you take the z x plane as your reference plane, and with reference to this plane, what is the angular departure of this point. So, a point in the z x plane itself, any point in the z x plane will have phi equal to 0, whereas this point that we have chosen to discuss in this figure, this is has got a departure from the z x plane through an azimuthal angle, which is measured by phi. And you can see that in this plane, phi can take a round trip and it can take all values from 0 to 2 pi. So, this is the range of phi, which goes from 0 to 2 pi. So, this is your spherical polar coordinate system. This distance given by the purple line from the z axis, you can measure it. This is the same row as you made use of the in the plane polar coordinate system, because this line is completely equal to this line. And what is this in terms of the spherical polar coordinates? This distance is r, this angle is theta. So, rho will be nothing but r sin theta. right? So, you can carry your transformation from one coordinate system to the other. You can go from x, y, z to rho phi z, and you can go over to r theta phi by carrying out these transformations. So, rho is equal to r sin theta, rho itself is square root of x square plus y square. So, you can always go from Cartesian to the cylindrical polar to spherical polar and carry out these transformations back and forth any which way, depending on what is going to make your mathematics the easiest or the least cumbersome. But any coordinate system will work, because there is nothing sacred about one or the other. So, these are the relations x is this distance, which is the projection of this line along the direction e x, along the unit vector e x. So, this will be rho cos phi, right. So, this is r sin theta cos phi, then this will be rho sin phi. So, this is r sin theta sin phi and this distance, which is z in your Cartesian coordinate system this will be nothing but 
r cos theta. So, you can carry out these transformations and write them, consolidate them over here in these three relations that x, y, z are re respectively given by these three relations and you can also carry out the inverse transformations and write r theta and phi in terms of the Cartesian coordinates, which are the inverse transformations. You can also carry out the transformations of the unit vectors and we will do it directly by writing it in a matrix form, because we know that it is much more convenient to use this matrix form. We have done this already for the plane polar coordinate system, so I will not work out the details step by step. I will leave it as an exercise, which I hope at least some of you will do or, or at least some of you will do some part of it, if not all. So, I, I people call me optimist and for good reason. So, this is a set of unit vectors E x, E y, E z. These are the Cartesian unit vectors and you can get the polar unit vectors E r, E theta, E phi. This is the unit vector in the direction in which the distance r would increase. This is the polar unit vector. It is the direction in which the polar angle theta would increase. This is the azimuthal unit vector. It is along the direction in which the azimuthal angle phi would increase, they are all of unit magnitude and they all constitute a right handed triad. So, E r cross E theta will give you E phi, E theta cross E phi will give you E r, right. So, uh, uh, you, you, uh, you can use any set of unit vectors, any coordinate system depending on the geometry, depending on the symmetry of the problem, you can choose an appropriate coordinate system. You can of course, get the inverse relations and you can do so by simply get getting the inverse of this matrix. So, vector algebra, matrix algebra, you know these are all integral parts of doing physics and these need not be looked at as mathematical exercises, because this is all part of getting the velocity. If velocity is physics, so is this. Okay, because you are going to get the velocity by taking the derivative of the position vector and if you take, if you describe the position vector in the spherical co polar coordinate system, you must take the derivatives of the corresponding unit vectors. So, you have to work with these inverse transformations as well and you have to work with the derivatives of these unit vectors. So, how let us see how these unit vectors change from point to point. So, you begin with a point which is the blue point and if you displace it to a new point, which is this red point and you pick this point, the second point to be on the surface of a sphere, the dhum 3 globe if you like, it is on the surface of a sphere of the same radius. You also keep it in the same plane. So, you know this is a plane between this purple line and this purple line. So, that the azimuthal angle is not changed, okay, that is the idea. And the only thing that has changed is the polar angle theta. So, there are 3 degrees of freedom r, theta and phi of which you have not changed r, the radial distance from the origin, nor have you changed the azimuthal angle which is phi. The only thing you have changed is the polar angle theta and now you can ask at what rate do the unit vectors change with respect to the polar angle theta keeping the other two parameters fixed. So, you will work again with partial derivatives. So, r is held constant, phi is held constant and you can see that this distance is r d theta, right, because this is the increment in the angle theta and you recognize this distance to be r d theta and you can likewise get the projections on different directions. So, if you were to move it not along this globe, but if you think of a cone or rather an inverted cone with this as the base and its vertex at the origin, then you have a cone which is made up of this circle, red circle, which would constitute the base of the cone and its vertex at the origin and you move this point on the rim of this cone from one point to another. Okay. So, now what you have done is that you have not changed theta, 
because all points on the rim of this cone are at the same polar angle theta, but what you have changed is the azimuthal angle phi, right. They are also at the same distance from the origin. So, there is no change with respect to r either, they are on the cross section, they are on the intersection of the surface and the cone. So, if you were to take a spherical surface at a distance r and intersect it by the rim of this cone, right, then what is changing on that rim is neither r nor theta, but phi alone and then you can take derivatives with respect to the azimuthal angle phi and you can do this geometry. I think it is a very important exercise, I do strongly urge you to do this as part of your homework, sit down with piece of paper, construct these diagrams and ask yourself at what rate do these unit vectors change with respect to r, theta and phi and now these figures that I have drawn for you should suggest to you how to get these derivatives. You can also construct volume elements, right and this volume element in the spherical polar coordinate system will be made up of a part of space, which is contained inside increments in, in r, which is along d r. Then there will be an increment along this, which is r d theta and then an increment along this, which is rho d phi, which is nothing but r sin theta d phi. Okay. So, and the product of this will give you the corresponding volume element. Make sure that the volume element has got dimensions of L cube, so that you have not missed out any parameter. So, here you have got L square coming from r square, theta and phi are dimensionless, but you have dr over here, which will give you the third dimension. So, so the volume element does have dimension of L cube. So, always keep track of the dimensions, it is a good idea and you can um, construct the rate at which the unit vectors change and here you are looking at the change in unit vector because of a change in the polar angle. Okay. So, this is the exercise that I had asked you to do, but you can do some of the exercise over here, so that I do not take any risk that you do not do it at all. So, there is this difference between the unit vector at position 2, subtract from it the unit vector radial vector at position 1. So, this is the unit vector, you draw a vector which is parallel to it, but in the opposite direction and you see that it is in the direction of e theta and its magnitude is delta theta e theta. Can you see that? Right. So, this change in the two unit vectors, the unit vector e r at two adjacent points and in these two adjacent points, I have chosen these adjacent points to be separated by the polar angle theta alone, not by r and not by phi. Okay. So, I carry out this change only in a fixed plane, a plane which is at a fixed azimuthal angle with respect to the z x plane. And if you look at this, then if you just divide this by delta theta, take the limit delta theta going to 0, you will get the rate at which the unit vector e r changes with respect to theta, it will be orthogonal to this, but knowing that is not enough, because there are two directions which are orthogonal to e r, one is e theta and the other is e phi, besides there is a plus and minus sign to worry about. So, you really have to work it out explicitly. Okay. So, this is what gives you the rate at which the unit vector e r changes with respect to theta, this is equal to e theta and then you can get the rate at which the other vectors e theta and e phi also change with respect to theta. And now, I will let you do this as homework. So, please, please, please do it. So, these are the results. So, the rate at which the unit vector e r changes with theta is e theta as we already found, the rate at which e 13 changes with theta is minus e r and the rate at which e theta changes with theta is 0, because it is not going to change the azimuthal unit vector will not change with theta. So, now 
you can write the transformation equations from E x, E y, E z to E r, E theta, E phi to get the derivatives of the unit vectors, you can always use the chain rule. I mean doing this geometry is sometimes worrisome, but good. Okay? It is tedious, but good. So, you should do that. On the other hand, using the chain rule is very straightforward. You do not have to draw complicated figures, because after all you have to depict these three dimensional creatures in the flat land. And sometimes, it becomes a little cumbersome. So, you can then do this by using the chain rules, because you can write the unit vectors in terms of the Cartesian unit vectors E x, E y and E z, and then take the derivative of E r with respect to phi. So, you have to take the derivative of each of these terms with respect to phi, but then E x, E y, E z are constant. So, their derivatives with respect to phi would vanish. So, you get a result, right? But now you have got a hybrid kind of quantity because you have got a polar creature on the left, on the right, you have got a mixed creature, the coefficients are polar, but the unit vectors are Cartesian. But you know how to transform the Cartesian unit vectors to the polar unit vectors. So, you can use those transformation relations and write everything in terms of the corresponding polar quantities. So, you can write this E x and E y in terms of E r, E theta, E phi using the transformation relations, and now you have got a result which has got only polar quantities. So, this is a purely polar relation, and you can write, uh, combine the terms, and you find that some of these terms cancel already. So, you can see that the component along E phi already can cancel. So, look at this component along E phi, it is a product of minus sin phi with minus cos phi. So, that is plus cos phi sin phi, but over here the component along E phi is also cos phi sin phi, but it is with a minus sign. So, when you combine all the terms, some of the components may kill each other okay? and then you will can get rather simple relations. So, this is in getting this relation, in getting the derivative of E phi with respect to phi, we have not plotted any figures, we are not drawn any figures, we are not thinking of three dimensional changes in a flat land, okay? that is sometimes difficult to do, but you can do it easily by using the chain rule. Okay? You get essentially the same results and you can get other partial derivatives also in a similar fashion. So, these are the net results which are consolidated here in the tricolor background. So, you have the rate at which the unit vectors E r, E theta and E phi change with respect to r, theta and phi. So, this is the rate at which the E r changes with respect to r and with respect to theta, with respect to phi and this is the rate at which the unit vector E theta changes with respect to r, with respect to theta and with respect to phi and this is the, the third unit vector namely the azimuthal unit vector and this tells us how it this one changes with respect to r and theta and phi. Okay? So, you do not have to write this out, but you have to derive them yourself and you know hopefully how to derive them, it is very simple. How would you describe motion in spherical polar coordinate system? So, position vector is just the distance times the radial unit vector. To get the velocity you require r dot, which is dr by dt, which is delta r by delta t in the limit, delta t going to 0. So, you have to take the differential increment in r, and this will come from the change in r, as well as the change in e r, because these unit vectors are not constants, unlike the Cartesian unit vectors. So, now you can get d e r, which will have components along e theta, as well as e phi but not along E r. Change in a unit vector is always orthogonal to it, that is all we know. But whether it will have a component only along E theta or only along E phi or along both, these are matters of details to be actually worked out and we have figured out how to do it. So, this is your differential increment in the position vector and this to get these changes, you know, 
you, you have to get the rate at which the unit vectors changes change with respect to the theta and phi and you can write all of these relations get the corresponding velocities by taking dividing this by delta t taking the limit delta t going to 0 and you have the velocity which will have a component along the radial the polar and the azimuthal directions. So, these corresponding components are called as the radial component, the polar component and the azimuthal component of the velocity. Likewise, you can get the second derivative and now you have plenty of terms, because look at this, I mean this is already a product of two functions, this is a product of three functions, this is a product of 1, 2, 3 and 4 functions and you have to take a derivative of the product of these functions using the same rule. The, the derivative of a product f and g with respect to t is f times d g by d t plus g times d f by d t. Right? So, it is the same kind of rule that you use no matter how many functions multiply each other in the argument of the derivative differential operator. So, there are plenty of terms and you combine all the components along the unit vector e r, e theta and e phi and you get uh, the net expression for the acceleration. There are plenty of terms over here and we are going to use this machinery when we solve the equations of motion in different coordinate systems and depending on the symmetry which is of interest to us, the results will be different. So, I will conclude this class today. If there are any questions, I will be happy to take. Um, I could suggest a few references for this. Uh, the Berkeley physics course and uh, classical mechanics by Davis are good sources for basic notions of vector algebra. Uh, Patrick Moore's uh, astronomy is a nice book to read, uh, not to learn about calculus of vectors or anything like that, but just to appreciate the orientations of different objects in the world around us. Because remember, that it is observations in the universe, it is astronomy which really inspired physical observations and is at the root of development of physics itself. So, Patrick Moore's book is something which I enjoyed very much, uh, you know reading about and looking at the stars and doing stargazing and learning about the constitutions and so on. Uh, at a more advanced level, you can read uh, mathematical methods for physicists by Arfkin um, or by Mary Bose and uh, we will now meet for the unit 4 in our next class in which we will work with the Kepler problem, but we will work with a specific aspect of the Kepler problem namely what is known as the dynamical symmetry of the Kepler problem. So, let me not jump ahead of ourselves at this point, uh, we will wait on it till we meet for the next unit in this course.